Welcome to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and it is always a pleasure. I say that every single program. It is. It's a pleasure to come your way, to bring you these programs, to bring you these guests and conversations here on a program that is designed to give you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. Today, it's a returning guest to our our program, and I'm really excited because uh, I really had a great time with him the last time we had our conversation. Um, he uh, he's going he's he he does a lot of stuff. He's I almost want to say he is a Renaissance man. His name is uh, is David Mark uh, uh, Quigley, and uh, he's he's an inspiration. He has overcome. Uh, a lifelong dyx- dyslexia. Uh, I have speech impediments, as you can tell, <laughs> by writing adventure novels. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, as well as another area of his life, many other areas of his life, um, having to do with a practice I tried to uh, to emulate, if you will, many years ago with my second wife here, in the, uh, the and, and she is still my second wife and my last wife. Uh, I I don't plan on going through that process ever again. Um, You know, it was uh, actually going through something along the lines and we'll find out the similarities and the differences between um, I Ching and I Chi and um, um, uh, uh, Tai Chi. Maybe they're the same thing just by a different name. Hey, David, it's great to have you back here on the program. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for having me again. And I'm really looking forward to today's uh, session. It's going to be uh, quite interesting. I think you're it a is. Very, yeah, you're a very interesting fellow unto yourself. So hopefully what I bring to the table will only enhance that. Well, I thank you so much for the compliment. What is the difference, if there is even a difference, if I'm even pronouncing them correctly? I know chi is the, is it, uh, I believe it's the Chinese term for uh, our our energy the the that which animates us as as a human being then there's tai chi and then there's the i ching talk to us about the differences the i've been studying the the i ching for the i ching for um for probably about nearly 15 years now and so um, I think you probably have more experience when it comes to Tai Chi than I have. And so I can really only talk to you about the I Ching and... <laughs> and about this uh, much, about this much. <laughs> yeah, and how it relates to, to the modern world and how I came to, um, to understand its... its um, its benefits in this modern age. And so really the the I Ching is all about um, change, the cycle of change. And so um, it is all about the truth of change. And the the I Ching is also known as the book of change or the book of changes. And what they say is that um, life goes through perpetual change and it's a it's a natural process and there are three components with it the ancient chinese basically said that there were was there was the initiating energy which they termed as coming from heaven and there is the um, responding energy which they called earth and then there were these things called humans and it's how that we interacted with that creative and responding energy. And so it was, um, the, the I Ching was first developed in the, um, the Zhao dynasty back nearly 3,000 years ago. And there were three, sorry, four philosophers that put this, the basis of it together. And it was the observation of, human life against natural phenomena. And so that's how they termed it. And so back then, ancient China wasn't referred to as ancient China. Mm. They were referred to as the Zhao people, people of Zhao. And it's spelt um, Z-H-O-U. And so that was the dynasty that took over after the Shang dynasty. And so these four sages 
put together the book of change, the book of changes. And one of them, the one of the probably the best known is Confucius. And Confucius um, gave an interpretation of what some preceding sages basically wrote about the phenomena of human action against the initiating and responsive energies. And so what I have discovered that today in our modern life, those energetic uh, phenomena still exist. It's just we use different terms and we use different um, modes of transportation, whether it's physical or whether it's whether it's mental. And so um, the Book of Change, the I Ching, basically allows us to use those philosophies based on a cycle of 64 changes to adapt it to life, to avoid misfortune and to enhance fortune. And that's it. So it gives us scenarios to live a better, more enriched, fulfilling life. And so what I've been able to do is from my past, when I established my peak performance consultancy, when I um, first gained my diploma in clinical hypnotherapy, was to relate a lot of these energetic signatures to how people took on subconscious beliefs and how these types of energies, some within us, internal and some external, relate to how we live our life from um, a practical and from a, I suppose, a subconscious level. And so that's really, I suppose, what we are going to discuss today. I think to some degree we will indeed. Uh, it is fascinating to me when I start looking at these different energy forces, if you will, that are um, part of the planet, let alone the universe, but part of the planet, uh, as well as uh, both human beings, as well as all of the other species that are on the planet. And even, uh, and and we're starting to recognize this, that there is the same energy force within the plants, the trees, and even the minerals. Uh, we're starting to understand that it, it's all, and I mean, even science has already verified this for us, that everything is nothing, it's nothing more than energy. It can, and energy cannot be destroyed. It cannot be thrown away, so to speak. It, it can only change form, which means that you and I, we can change form. We can transform into something else. And there are those who believe that with with the one phrase uh, notwithstanding that, you know, we are human beings or spiritual beings having a human experience, that we are also on an evolutionary path. And that, and I love um, the, the this one episode in uh, Star Trek Next Generation where this one individual, uh, and he happens to be portrayed in the program in that episode as a male, uh, he is going through something that he doesn't fully understand. And neither does his society, his culture. And they want him locked up because he is interfering with what they perceive as his, his culture perceives as uh, the, the natural order of things. And as the episode progresses, spoiler alert, uh, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> um, he starts to go through these, these minor convulsions and physical changes, transformations to this being of golden light who is then able to just trans uh, to, to travel right through the hull of the, of the, uh, of the ship and out into space. He has now become, um, uh, you might say fully actualized. He has now become a fully spiritual. He has now become totally energy and that is represented by this, golden this uh, golden body this golden light body and that's just one interpretation of our evolution um then there's the conversation i'm sure that i'm sure you've had with folks about our origins and 
not necessarily our origins as maybe depicted in in the uh, uh, the, the 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 teachings, the writings uh, of the Old Testament, but more the origins of whether or not we're even even indigenous to this planet. Some don't believe that we came from here. So it is one of those uh, situations where, you know, you 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 really try to, uh, you know, try to put a, a a handle on it, or you know, to make sense of it. And sometimes, even when you start asking these questions and you start formulating your hypotheses, it's like it just raises more questions <laughs> every time you turn around. What is your perspective? And this this was phrased this way uh, um, to one of my guests. I said, uh, who are we really? I mean, is there going to come a point where we're going to know who we really are? And they said, no. I said, what we're going to find out is we're going to finally learn who we have always been. So maybe addressing both of those perspectives, if you will, what's your perspective and in terms of what you have experienced uh, in your life through many of these practices, as well as your experiences with wildlife and so forth? Um, why don't you put me on the spot, Richard? Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things, I was raised in a very conservative environment in the country community in New Zealand. But one of the one of the opportunities that I had was that I suffered from severe dyslexia. And so I was able to look beyond what was considered the norm because I wanted to try and get over that disability. And so I was able to look at I suppose other modalities, ways of learning, those type of things. Mm -hmm. And that really didn't happen for me until I started traveling overseas and I saw a whole new world out there. And I was overseas for several years and I came back and I decided that I wanted to make a psychological change because of my dyslexia and I wanted to overcome it. And so... I ended up studying for and gaining my diploma in clinical hypnotherapy because I needed to make that psychological change. And after I had gone and received the diploma, I, I established a consultancy for peak performance because a lot of people just started coming to me because they wanted to... Um, perform at peak levels. And so because of my um, my focus with hypnotherapy, I was undertaking a lot of regression therapy. And so I would regress, regress clients to times in their past to try to establish what was holding them back and preventing them from performing at peak levels. And so I learned very early on that I had to have a very open mind when it came to performing regression therapy. And so I dealt with a lot of athletes, high achievers, um, company executives and the like. And I remember distinctly one regression session that I undertook, the CEO of that was that was with me, he actually regressed into a lifetime that wasn't in this existing lifetime. Mm. And the trauma or the event that was holding him back was very pertinent to that particular time. And we were able to overcome or change the subconscious belief at that time which flowed into his current lifetime and it over he was able to overcome that impediment that prevented him from performing at a peak level and so from that time i stopped having preconceived notions of where we had come from mm. and so was that an actual past life or was it a 
memory, it doesn't really matter because it helped the person overcome a traumatic event and perform at a optimum level from that point on. And so I believe that we have experienced certain experiences that shape who and what we are. And I like what you said or what the guest said is that we realized who we were, not potentially who we're going to be, where we've come from. And so one thing that I learned from all these regression sessions that I've done, I've, I've done hundreds, possibly even thousands, that I discovered that when a person was in a this particular state that was conducive to undertake a regression therapy, a regression session, that there were energies that were at play. There were internal energies that shaped them, but there were external energies that also um, influenced them. And so it was there was this interesting dynamic of what was going on inside them and how they were um, and, and how they interacted with their internal energy and how they were influenced by those external, um, their external environment. Mm -hmm. And so it, it mirrored very closely that I discovered later on how the I Ching portrays external energies and internal energies. And so you, you brought up a very good point about um, energy and that the only thing constant in our world is energy changing. And so, as I said before, the only thing constant is change. Mm -hmm. You've just added a new dimension to it. It is the energy the changes. So during these regression therapies, I identified that it was the change of energy that determined how people were held back. And once that energy or that belief was changed, how they then could perform at more optimum uh, levels. And so again, it's it, it comes back to the basis of who and what we are, which is energy and how we are influenced by our own energy and the external energy from, from outside. And so we can look at it from a very spiritual point of view, or we can look at it from a very practical, scientific point of view. And so I've been lucky enough, as I said, to have severe dyslexia. And by my road to overcome it, I've been able to influence my own mind and to change the way that I think my cognitive ability to be able to tap into those energy fields. Some call it, um, well, it's just an in intuitive level that I'm able to, that, that subtle level that I'm able to tap into. Now, originally I didn't understand what was happening? I just thought, yes, because of this neuroplasticity, neuroplasticity that I went through, and I changed certain um, cognitive functions and enhanced things that had been potentially well that were defective. I didn't lose that right side compensation, but I also enhanced the left side um, functioning as well. And I thought when a person came and sat with me, I was just had this enhanced ability through my intuition to figure out what needed to happen for that person to, to perform it at, at optimum levels. But I then discovered years later that it wasn't necessarily that. It is just our interconnectedness and our ability to interact at those subtle levels. Hmm. And the subtle levels are um, levels of energy. You know, I'm I'm in the process of um, I'm in the process of finally, finally, getting my first book out. Um, the publication date is September seventh, the anniversary, the seventeenth anniversary of uh, "Tell Me Your Story," uh, and um, 
sevens are a big deal here because my mother's birthday is on September 17th and I plan on publishing on the 7th and then sending her a copy that I hope will get there in, in within those 10 days. Um, but I've noticed as I'm going through the process of editing and this book's actually, uh, I don't want to say that it spans uh, uh, several decades. In a matter of speaking, it does, because much of what I have written in there, in this book, comes from, uh, you might call it a journal that I was writing back in 1994 when I first got into computers. And so I'm incorporating that in with some of the newer stuff. And when I say newer, within the last 15 or 20 years since my wife and I moved to Santa Barbara. And um, as I go through it, and this has to do with the whole issue of transformation or change, if you wish. I had one guest who said, you know, don't use the word change, because if you can change it this way, it can be changed back. So you might want to use the word transform. And I'm thinking, well, couldn't you say the same thing about transform? <laughs> if it can be transformed one way, I mean, take a look at the Transformers. You know, those characters in the <laughs> in the comic book thing, they transform back and forth between a truck and a robot, you know, those kinds of things. But I'm watching myself and listening to as I because I'm what I'm doing to edit. I record it as I'm editing it so that I can hear how it sounds. And then I'll start adding stuff. I'll start adding a little stories or anecdotes and this and that and the other. So now the book is starting to change or transform, whether it be expanding or contracting. It's transforming. The universe does this all the time. Not necessarily in terms of it's it's expanding and contracting all the time. I have no idea because we have no clue. We can't even wrap our brains around the infinity as we theorize the infinity of the universe, the, the expanse. But one of the things that I find so interesting in this process is as I as I'm editing, but I'm also doing these interviews such as with you. And other people, and I'm thinking, okay, well, I need to, I need to find a way to incorporate that into into the book. And it's like, okay, this book will never get finished. And that's like, I'm not going there. Okay, if if as I'm going through the process, I'll add it, well, a little bit, but then I keep moving on and keep moving on and keep moving because I've already set, I don't know, fifteen or twenty different publication dates over the last twenty years, and um, and obviously they they didn't come to fruition. This one. I'm going to meet. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to meet this, this goal. Uh, it, it, I am determined. Um, and it feels right. It feels good. So the process of us transforming, and I think about you and your dyslexia, my, my present wife also suffered with dyslexia as she was going through school, got no help whatsoever. Uh, I myself was legally blind, hated reading in front of the class. We talked about this the last time you and I, but at the same time, we were watching a documentary just yesterday uh, as of this conversation. And every once in a while, they would throw up this text, white text on a black background. And I would pause it and she would read it because it's still a little far for me to read, even on a 58 inch uh, screen. Uh, and I let her work through it. If she wants to, uh, if she if she needs help to pronounce something, she'll spell it out for me. And then I usually am able to help her with that. But my understanding with dyslexia as part of your process, uh, you, you know, you say you overcome it, but my understanding is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the issue is around being able to decode the code, letters and numbers. And that if maybe it were a different, and I'm going to use the word code, if it were a different code instead of the alphabet in our in our English language, if it was something other than that, I wonder, I, I, I have to, I, I mean, we even ask this question of uh, people of other languages, whether it be the, the Chinese or Arabs or Russians or what have you, do they have this same issue of dyslexia with their code? Um, uh, you know what? I'm going to stop right there and ask you that question, you know, to, to pose that for you to share with us a little bit about your understanding of, of what it is and isn't what dyslexia is and isn't and how you have transformed your life, whether it be around it or to uh, go through it 
to go beyond what it could have limited you to do in your life? Okay, so I can only I can only relate to how dyslexia has affected me. Mm -hmm. And so um, there are probably numerous forms of dyslexia. And so for me, numbers aren't really an issue. It is just the it is just the 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 written word that um I, I I had an, an issue with. Mm -hmm. And so I had a propensity, uh, a genetic propensity to be predisposed with dyslexia because of my parents. And I ended up suffering a blunt force trauma event at a very early age where I hit the left side of my, my head and it affected the temporal parietal lobe and the occipital temporal region and the um the temporal parietal lobe is the area that allows people to to visually to um to it's the processing of sounds mm -hmm. sounds of words and it's breaking them into the um the the phonological sounds of words and their their phenouns. And so I just wasn't able to do that. And I still can't. I still have a difficulty of breaking words up into syllables. And so um, when I would be presented with a written text, I just, I couldn't break those words up. And then the um, occipital temporal area of the brain is the visual part of the brain and so with those two areas of the brain I just couldn't read at all I couldn't spell I just um, I just shied away from anything academic and so I never passed an English test in my life and I never read my first book until I was 23 years of age and so it wasn't until I I got my diploma in clinical hypnotherapy and I embarked on writing my first book that I started changing my brain's processes. And so while the, um, the temporal parietal area hasn't developed as much as the occipital temporal area, I enhanced that occipital temporal area so I could remember words, whole words. And so I embarked on a lot of rote learning. And I learned that if I, I um, was very repetitious with words, say 20 to 50 times, depending on the context, I would remember that word. And so it was through that ability of the struggle of learning words that now I have a massive reservoir of words that I already know. Um, the under I understand what they are and how to pronounce them. And so while I cannot break them up into syllables, I know what the word is. And so for me, it's very... Um, I'm very comfortable with the English language now. But if I vacation to a foreign country i remember going to france it was terrible for me because i couldn't read the street signs because i didn't know the words and i hadn't and i couldn't pronounce them out and i hadn't learned and i hadn't memorized them mm -hmm. through rote learning and so um that's the way it affected it affected me and when i embarked on writing and learning through rote repetition to, to be able to write, I was able to lapse at times into the flow straight, into the flow state, which allowed me to change the, the neuroplasticity through neuroplasticity, mm -hmm. those brain pathways to memorize the words. And so that's how it affected for me. 
Now, you brought up about um, with different languages, different scenarios and those type of things. When it comes to the I Ching, because the I Ching speaks in metaphors, um, in um, stories and those sort of things, and, and it invokes images within you, that's very easy for me to understand. So the the wording, because I'm able now to read it, but because of the imagery that it invokes through those um, parables and metaphors and 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 poetry, I can I can have these images, which is a a different type of intellectual language, and so it's it's pretty well second nature to me. Mm. So um, I think if you can. For somebody who has dyslexia, you can look at things from a uh, an image perspective. You can then relate back those words to how to associate them and how to basically remember them. I hope that went some way of answering your question. <laughs> it did. It did indeed. And and it seems to me that um, again, it is. Uh, an issue of uh, uh, being able to to understand, as I use the term code. But I will tell you that I think your dyslexia had very little to do with your ability to read the signs in France, because I don't have dyslexia, as far as I know. And I had trouble reading the, uh, the street signs uh, in uh, Ireland that are both in English and Gaelic. And I had no idea... <laughs> what the Gaelic words were. So I think you and I, we share that uh, only because it was a foreign country to us and uh, we had never been exposed to those kinds of things. Uh, needless to say, it is still, an, a, it's a monumental process. I have to, uh, uh, my wife paid me a compliment uh, some time ago when we uh, we had only been together for, for a short time and I was very much aware because he'd shared with me her issues surrounding dyslexia that uh, she thanked me for not uh, not helping her. So when she would start to read something, I would sit there and just listen. Only um, offering if asked. Only offering if asked. And at one point, she was reading quite fluently, fluidly and fluently, if you will. Uh, and... Um, so I I I am I'm very proud of her in that regard that she had the 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 wherewithal. Uh, she still deals with I think the issues surrounding uh, the lack of help as she was growing up, uh, the lack of understanding of what she was going through by the adults around her, and um, and and so she still deals with that level of frustration. But at least she now has the freedom, at least around me, take her to take her time. You don't have to rush, just relax, you know, and usually that helps her to be able to get through it, knowing that, oh, I can, I can relax. And when she relaxes, there's no tension. And I think that the, the I Ching is, is part of that too. Tai Chi is one of her practices. I, um, and, and he, he made me laugh when he said, I knew probably more about uh, Tai Chi than you, because um, when I was uh, first with her, within the first few months, we went to uh, one of uh, her friends who uh, held a, gr a group Tai Chi practice in his backyard. Beautiful lawn. Oh, it was beautiful green, soft on the feet. We always went out there barefooted. And I was invited. And I went out there and I didn't know the movements, not nothing. And I'm watching the people around me, you know, and I'm, and I'm just thinking, okay, let's see. Okay. Do it like this. Okay. Follow that person. <laughs> and finally the instructor whose name was Sunyata Saraswati. He was the co-author of a book called Jewel in the Lotus uh, with a woman by the name of uh, Bodhi. And uh, he came over to me and he says, stop. He says, just listen to the music, feel the energy and let it flow through you. And you just move how you feel led to move. And it was like, okay, then I'm going to, I was like, I'm going to close my eyes and I'm just going to do that. And it was like being, again, given that permission to stop, relax, and just feel the energy. 
And I, 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 what's really sad in our society, in our culture is that we're not given the time to do that. It's, it's, it's so fast paced. We got to move, got to move. Gotta... It's like with my book. I mean, I've been working on it probably for the last, uh, um, uh, oh, 20, 22 years, uh, from the standpoint of finally saying, you know, I need to take this information from 2021 when my wife was going through cancer. I, then I need to put this into a book. And as I mentioned earlier, putting those publication dates, those, those, those deadlines, you know, and I, like I said, I've probably 15 or 20 different deadlines over the last 20 years. And now I've got another deadline, but this one feels right. And I'm actually in the book. I've just gotten to chapter five, which is the final chapter. And, um, I'm going through it and I'm recording it and I'm editing it and I'm taking this out and adding this and so on and so forth. But I'm just, I'm relaxed and it feels so good. You've written quite a number of books yourself, primarily, um, you know, uh, uh, on, on the wildlife. And they, these are, if I'm remembering correctly, fictional stories with factual information, correct? Correct. Yep. Do you, because <laughs> I, I, I don't necessarily believe that, an, I don't know this, that a, an individual grows out of dyslexia any more than I was going to grow out of legal blindness. Um, but do you feel that sense of relaxation when you start to write the stories? Oh, definitely. So um, I can sit and write and three, four hours can go by and I don't even notice it. And so, yes, there is a, a level of peace that I experience when I'm writing that I don't uh, necessarily experience at any other time. Mm. So it's, um, you know, while I am writing these books and donating a percentage of my royalties to, um, you know, my wildlife um, foundation, mm -hmm. I'm writing for myself first and foremost. And because of the relaxation that it has given me, but also because of what writing has allowed me to do. It's allowed me to... Um, excel in areas that I wouldn't have otherwise done it. If I didn't embark on my first novel, I wouldn't have changed those neurological pathways. I wouldn't have gained that energetic understanding of how I interact with the world. And I probably would not have done a lot of what I have in the world. And, and one of the things that I find very interesting that you just said, Richard, was that you you mentioned being given permission or when your wife asked you to assist. Mm -hmm. I think this is a key component of, um, of, of enhanced performance. We, especially when it comes to something like hypnosis, you, I need permission to work with a client. And if they don't give it, it doesn't, doesn't happen. Now, we all know about um, uh, stage hypnotism. Uh, oh, yeah. I've been through all, all, Yeah. All, all stage <laughs> hypnotists do is they look for subtle signs within the audience and they're potentially leaning to one side or they're scratching their nose or they're doing something. and They're looking for those members in the audience that are emulating them, that are going along with them, essentially giving them permission to, to work with them. And that's when they call the person up on stage and they, you know, do a simple trick of, of getting them to, to be influenced in a, in a particular way. But in a clinical setting, um, a person doesn't come to me unless they've given me permission. And then I take that permission and we're able to work at an energetic level to overcome that particular area and the same with the I Ching as well 
The I Ching is based on asking questions, pertinent questions that an individual has at a particular time that they want solved. And so if you can articulate a question, you already have the knowledge to have it answered. And so sometimes we just need assistance to have those questions answered. Mm. And so by asking somebody like myself, uh, an I Ching practitioner, the question, they've given permission. And so then we can work at an energetic level to determine what the correct answer is for that person. And so it's getting back to what you said, asking for help or being given permission. And so if you look at life and the energy of life and you take it to the molecular or even the sub-molecular level, all molecules are trying to do is they're trying to seek balance. And so that is how we are able to prosper in our life if we seek balance and we achieve balance. And so once you have that balance, then you're able to lead a more fulfilling, enriched life. And so... That's why I always talk about the I Ching or hypnosis having a neurological and scientific base because there is similarities throughout neurobiology or through science that points towards why these modalities work and how they work. And so it's not a... Uh, necessarily a spiritual practice, it could be, but it also it is definitely a scientific practice that is based in neurology, neurobiology, or even science. And so, but I think that it comes back to what you said before, Richard, of giving permission or asking for assistance. And then once you once you take that first step, then really the um, the best course of action will be available to you. Mm -hmm. We're talking with uh, David Mark uh, Quigley, and uh, we're talking about the work that he is doing. He has a foundation as well, which we're going to talk about here as well as we continue here on Tell me your story, new paradigms for a new world. We are giving you choices and knowledge of those choices. Don't make your dreams come true. He has a number of um, uh, books on his website, uh, wildlife, if you will, books. David Mark quigley.com is the website which we will be linked to and of course we're also linked on the in our first conversation our first interview together uh so that you can find out more about the work that he is doing uh, i find it interesting uh, david that you know it's it's there, there's sort of an irony of sorts okay in that <clears throat> you have written a number of books while you know uh, stories that are published and are available uh, again through your website and yet here you are, a man who uh, has has suffered with uh, or has worked with the issue of dyslexia. Uh, the thought that was coming to me earlier, I was just curious about this, if you're able to put a number on this. As a child growing up with dyslexia, by comparison to the adult that you are now, what would you say would be the... I want to use, I'll use the term level of difficulty then versus now. It sounds like the Olympics. Okay. What's the level of difficulty in this particular uh, uh, endeavor that Michael, uh, David is going to go through here. Uh, but I'm curious <laughs> as to what, what would you be, be and, and we'll keep it on a scale of one to 10. Uh, what would you, would you say that as a child growing up, what would that level of difficulty and um, has it changed and how has it changed to what number would it be today? Well, Richard, I'd give this level of difficulty about a, an eight. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, um, okay. So I, I was, um, I had a very traumatic childhood. And so because of certain things that happened to me, I constantly, looked over my shoulder in fear. 
And so not only did I have the difficulty with dyslexia, I also I also lived in, in fear and unreasonable fear. And so it wasn't until I went overseas that um, I left that fear behind. And so the, you know, the level, it, it, my childhood was extremely difficult and it was just compounded by the dyslexia. And so now as an adult, um, you know, the, the difficulty that was probably a seven or eight as a childhood is now at a, you know, a, a, a two or a three. Mm. And so I'm very um, comfortable with who and what I am. I know why I, I, why I experience certain things and why I reacted the way that I did. And so I'm pretty comfortable with that sort of thing. And so now the, the way that I try to live my life is I do those things that, one, um, it enrich me, two, that I'm good at, and three, benefits people around me. Mm. And so the, while the books that I write are fiction, there are, there are life stories within them that people can use to help enhance their life. Yes, they, I'm giving to wildlife, but also there are anecdotal stories that are going to help people live a, a better life. Mm -hmm. And so, and with using the I Ching also, I'm helping people answer some of those difficult questions to assist their life, to answer those things that have potentially held them back and can move them forward. Um, I also have written another book, Richard, which is actually a, a nonfiction book. Mm -hmm. And it's specifically relating to um, biology and, and um, sub-micron particles and how we can use a... Um, a process that I developed to be able to decontaminate physical environments to help people um, live in a cleaner, um, cleaner envi internal environment. And so I do have another consultancy, which is called um, Bio-Risk Decontamination Restoration. And I work in a very narrow field of uh, microbial and biological contaminations. And so while I don't really discuss it very much, um, those areas I have come to excel at because I understand them at a molecular level and a molecular energetic level. And so that's what a lot of the things that I, I base my life on is how can we change the energy of this to be able to improve it? Hmm. Well, I must say that as far as the uh, the conversation we're having here regarding dyslexia and your uh, ranking, if you will, from an eight to a two, uh, I, I have to tell you also uh, that uh, you did nail the dismount. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> we're talking with David Mark Quigley. Uh. And um, uh, I, what I find interesting, too, is is the impact that because you, you mentioned this earlier in the program, the head injury on the left side, and and, and the the extent of that injury that you as you described it, uh, what what difference, if any, did that make in regards to uh, your your cognitive skills, let alone your dyslexia? Did it make it better, worse, no change? Oh no, it definitely made it worse. So it was from that point on that the dyslexia expressed itself and. Um, and yeah, I, I started having that that difficulty with the the written and the the spoken word. Mm. Folks, he has uh, several books that uh, you can get a copy of, and um, I hope that you will. 
uh, one in particular that I think you can actually get a free download of. African Lion is the title of the book. Uh, it is um, how the um, uh, Barbary Lions escaped extinction. He's got several, three others uh, that uh, you can also get a copy of. The Last Rhino, White Gold, and um, Scars of the Leopard. I'm curious if if you're working on anything new lately in this particular series, or is that is that kind of complete the series, those four books? Oh, no, not at all. I've finished another one. It's called um, The Last Scales, and it is about the... Um, the most poached mammal in the world, the pangolin. And so that is actually complete. And um, we're about to uh, present that to publishers shortly. And then I'm also um, two thirds of the way through the, um, so what'll be that? That'll be the seventh one. Mm -hmm. And this, it'll be um, the last rhino, which is also a free download on Amazon, um, the current one that I'm working on is called uh, 2000 Rhinos. The The last rhino is about the black rhino, which is a, a browser. Um, um, and the, the, the book that I'm writing at the moment, 2000 Rhinos, is about the white, the southern white rhinos. And so I'm um, 100,000 words into that particular uh, book, and I hope to have that probably finished by the by the end of the year. Mm. So um, yeah, I do have I I will be continuing the the African series with a number of a number more number of of more books. Well, folks, whether you support the work that we are doing through Tell Me Your Story or you support the work that uh, uh, David is doing through his books, uh, with your purchase of any of his books, you are uh, seamlessly donating to a worthwhile cause as a portion of all the proceeds to his books goes to the wildlife preservation, goes to wildlife preservation. And he, uh, we thank you so much for being a part of that, folks, uh, as well as the, uh, it is the, of course, the Quigley Wildlife Foundation is what is referred to there. I, um, I'm, I'm so always, I'm always so intrigued uh, by uh, the work that our guests are doing, yourself included, obviously. And and um, I'm curious as to what other endeavors you might be taking on uh, in the coming months and years beyond the authoring. And many of the, I mean, and I would have no problem if you were to go through and maybe talk a little bit about some of the things you're doing now outside of the writing, okay, um, and so forth. And obviously outside of the, the aspects of the uh, I Ching. Uh, in terms of some of the things that people can go to your website to find out more, uh, to find out more and also to maybe get in touch with you to work with you. Well, the best way that they can look at working with me is to go to davidmarkquigley.com and that will, um, that will channel them to either the writing or the the I Ching, but um, I also have another website, which is um, biorisk.us, which is to do with a um, my, my company Biorisk, which is, um, I'm, a, I'm one of the few people that understands and is able to deactivate mycotoxins. So mycotoxins are the secondary metabolites of mold. And so most people think that it is mold that is making them sick when they're in a moldy environment. Mm -hmm. And so, but one thing that a lot of people don't understand is that mold, uh, when it is challenged, produces these toxins called mycotoxins. Mycotoxins are not living organisms, but they are very toxic and they cause incredible harm to the immune system. And so um, the I have a, a book on Amazon. Again, you can download that for free, which is called Mycotoxin Deactivation. And it walks through a case study that I went through that shows how you can actually deactivate mycotoxins in situ when you have that contamination. Most people think the only way to get rid of mycotoxins is through demolition. 
but I've proven through a process of molecular destruction, you can actually deactivate mycotoxins. And so what I've been able to achieve is I've been able to take a mycotoxin um, and I've been able to change its molecular structure and basically tear it apart, leaving only water or ambient humidity in its place. And so um, that particular process can be used for, as obviously mycotoxins, but it also can be used for endotoxins, which come from um, gram-negative bacteria like salmonella, um, also, um, the, the process can be used for um, actinomyces, getting rid of actinomyces, decontaminating actinomyces, which are a gram-positive bacteria. And they're finding with water-damaged buildings that not only the mold, but they also can be contaminated with bacteria. And so um, living in Florida, I... Um, am always dealing with mouldy environments. And some contaminated sites that I've walked into that should be mould contamination sites are not, in fact, mould contaminated sites. They are, actually bio, they are actually bacterially contaminated because the bacteria has taken over the mould and is using it for food. And so um, if you look at um, some of the... Dr. Shoemaker's theories, or not theories, but practices that with water damaged buildings and those 25% of individuals that are that do not have the gene that can de that they can use to decontaminate themselves, they're finding that bacteria and molds are uh, very prevalent for these health concerns that the people have. So that's one field that is far removed from my writing and from my eating practice. Mm. And so, um, and again, I'm, I'm published in that. And, and it's a very interesting um, case study that I went through of how to basically deactivate those um, contaminated sites. You know, it has been said, and I think I can attest to this fact with my own personal experiences uh, with my wife, uh, that uh, people with uh, dyslexia are some of the most intelligent, empathic, intuitive individuals. And when I start start seeing programs featuring, and usually they're documentaries, sometimes news stories, about, uh, oh, what's the word I want? Prodigies. Um, I think that's the right word. For example, a, a, a child who sits down at the piano never studied music and is playing Mozart flawlessly. All right. Um, I know there's another another uh, word for that, but uh, be that as it may. And then there's the autistic spectrum. And I realize that to the and I say this in quotes, normal world, uh, they're different. That's true. But I remember hearing it put this way, that they aren't really different. It's just that they're living in the present, in the now. They're not thinking about the past. Then they're not thinking about the future. They're right here. Whereas you and I, uh, uh, David, uh, probably spend and I, I don't know exactly what the stats are, but I know it's fairly high. We spend a fair percentage of our thinking time thinking about either the past or the future. We're not here now, like in this conversation. And yes, every so often when you will you will say something that triggers a thought, uh, okay, I've, I've gone somewhere else a little bit, but it's like, okay, I'll bring that back. And hey, what about this? And so forth. Uh, that's a little different, I think. But that to me is 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 astounding because we could learn a heck of a lot from these folks who are living in the now moment. Do you ever find yourself uh, uh, challenged with that? Uh, thinking about because uh, I was going to ask you earlier about 
all of your accomplishments. And for me, I think about my accomplishments, but every so often I feel like I'm, especially when I think about my late father, I feel like that five or six or seven year old kid. Once again, you know, when I think about my dad and when I was that old, that age, I didn't have any thoughts about the past or future. I was living in the moment. I wasn't going to school or it was summertime and we were running around barefoot in the grass and having play and playing and having a grand time. And that's what we were thinking about. If we were thinking at all, we were just playing. Well, what about you and, and, and your experiences with the past and the future and the present moment? Well, it was very interesting that you talked about people with dyslexia, and I would class myself, if I had to put a label on myself, would be a serial entre entrepreneur. Oh, yeah. And so, and this, the, the research that's done onto, into entrepreneurs is that a vast majority of them are dyslexic, or they have some dyslexic tendencies, because we think outside the box. And so we are always looking for ways to potentially do something better or to solve a problem, those types of things. But I do have to admit, in my earlier days, I was consumed with the past. And I was raised in an environment that my parents conditioned me to worrying about what other people would think. Mm. And so it was, I mean, it was, it was stupid. I mean, because half the time we, we shouldn't be, or most of the time we shouldn't even be concerned what other people are thinking because we'll, we'll never, we'll never know. And so worrying, I was always worrying about what other people were potentially thinking, not that I ever knew or worrying about, or having an underlying fear that somebody was going to attack me. So, yes, I was consumed by the past, but a lot of it was past conditioning. And once I've now overcome a lot of that, I can, I can now look at what is going on basically here and now and look forward to what I want to create in the future. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I've got to be very busy. I have great difficulty sitting, doing nothing. I mean, I will meditate every day for, you know, half an hour to uh, an hour, but that's it. That's the only time during the day <laughs> that I'm going to sit in silence. And so the rest of the time I, I want to be active. I want to be doing something. I want to be enhancing what I am doing, whether it's physically, whether it's um, renovating a, you know, a property, or whether it's um, enhancing systems and processes in, in, in one of my businesses, or um, crafting a new chapter or editing an old one. Mm. So... Um, yeah, I find it very interesting also what you said about um, people being on the spectrum because all that is is they think differently and mm -hmm. it's not too different than somebody with dyslexia. We just think differently. Yeah. That's it. And and we, uh, in our society, we, we do tend to label, compartmentalize, all those kinds of things. And in many instances, what that ends up doing is it ends up dividing us, separating us. <clears throat> rather than looking at those differences and saying, I wonder uh, what I can learn from that person because they think differently. I did an interview uh, some time ago on the subject of uh, sociopaths, psychopaths, narcissists. And I asked the question, is, and this was the way I phrased the question, is there anything we can really learn from these people, I mean, come on, they're psychopaths, they're sociopaths, and they're narcissists, and they're so self-focused. And they said, yeah, it may sound strange, but there are things, even though we, you and I, David, probably would agree there that the means do not necessarily justify the ends. Uh, the category of the three that I just listed, they don't care. And this was one of the things my guest mentioned, he said, and that's what we can learn from them. They get things done. 
They don't care about the means justifying the ends. They don't care about the means at all. They care about getting something done, whether it's illegal or ethical or moral or what have you. And what we learn is that we need to be persistent in finding those new ways of doing things that are legal and or ethical and or moral. And I've always believed this, that there is always a workaround. I learned this primarily uh, through computers. There's always a workaround. And, um, and, and I have been, uh, I've been proving that uh, for the last 45 years that I've been in this business. Uh, every time there's a, a challenge, there's a piece of equipment that goes down. Okay, well, we can't use that one. What do we, now what do we do? And, uh, you know, I got to think for a few minutes and, okay, we can try this and then we go that way and do this and the other. Uh, and even with our high technology of today on the computer in terms of things like Zoom and trying to conduct an interview where, well, I really only need the audio. Well, Zoom has a telephone in it. Really? Well, our phone lines are down, but the internet's still working. So da 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 So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's learning how to critically think too, but at the same time, recognizing Again, there is always a workaround. Uh, we're going to put, you know, that one website you mentioned, the other website of yours. We're going to put that into the description of the video and audio so that people can uh, find out more about that uh, that aspect. Uh, I, I had to really, I, I was annoyed at first, but then chuckled. Uh, a day or two or three after the lockdown back in 2020, March 2020, uh, I was astounded at how many members of the media had gotten their uh, um, epidemiological certification. It was incredible how much they already knew and could tell us what was and wasn't the truth. And I'm not taking sides here because there are multiple sides to this thing. All I'm saying is I didn't get my uh, epidemiological uh, certification. Uh, I just tried to read what I could. I tried to intuit much of what I uh, was was processing and uh, trying to determine what was what would work for me uh, and, and not putting that on anybody else. And I don't do that with this program either. I, I, uh, I should say I do that with this program. When I share something, that's mine, all right? If you want to consider the possibilities of using that, hey, that's up to you. That's on you, not me. I'm not going to force anybody to uh, do or think or say or be uh, the way that I am, um, it's, it, you know, it's mine, just like what you're doing in your life. That's yours. And, uh, we're, we're, I am uh, so proud of that in that regard. I have one other question in regards to your, 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 uh, your writings specifically regarding the wildlife. It has been said, and I would venture, you probably know this, that over the course of even pre-human history, Millions of species have come and gone. Why, from your perspective, why is that so important now in terms of these different species that are on the fringes of extinction, and some of them are a little further away from the fringes? Why is that so important to to, uh, to us and our life? And uh, I don't want to say livelihood, but uh, our our existence as humans on the planet. Well, it comes down to those keystone species. And so you may hear people talk about keystone species and what they are. And so a lot of these um, a lot of these animals that are on the verge of extinction are keystone species. And a keystone species basically is what the definition um, states is that they are key in that, environment that they are living for example the next book that i'll be publishing the last scales it's about the most trafficked mammal on earth which is a pangolin now the pangolin is an insectivore and so all it does is eats insects and it is known by another name the scaly anteater and so um if they they are a keystone species. And if they leave the habitat that they have frequented for centuries, then there is going to be an influx of insects. And so those insects then don't have one of the key predators that was feeding on them. 
And so their numbers are going to proliferate and eventually it's going to start affecting humans because there's going to be more insects, because there's going to be crop failure, because there's going to be that roll-on effect. And so while there are millions of species that have gone extinct, um, they went extinct because of environmental factors. And so, but the factor that seems to be at play here is the human being. And so the human being is the one that is driving these keystone species towards extinction, not necessarily because of a climactic or environmental change that changes the whole environment. So, um, for example, with um, elephants and rhinos, for example, in the wild, they have a a very important role because they are going to open up pathways through jesse bush and thick bush um, that allows other animals to be able to browse and graze on those areas that have opened up and so they are um, benefiting the environment for not just themselves but for other animals as well. And so when we are instrumental in driving a keystone species towards extinction, we're going to cause difficulty for ourselves. I've also heard it said too, uh, over the, um, the life of the planet since it was formed and then, uh, inhabited by whatever started and moved forward um that uh the planet has been in we'll call it crises uh, at least five times and bounced back and bounced back and bounced back and bounced back which is that's great the planet is very resilient um i i get a little annoyed with people who start talking about the science primarily because there are too many people who don't agree on the science. And I think I mentioned this in our last conversation. Uh, I bring up the issue. Don't you think we should, I mean, forget about the science, forget about climate change, forget about any of that. Don't you think we should just clean up our home? I mean, come on, you know, uh, pick up the trash. Don't be dumping your motor oil uh, onto the ground uh, and all of these different things. We need to be taking care of our home. I mean, this is this is there is no there is no other home. There is no planet uh, plan B or planet B. And in, in spite of what a lot of people are saying, hey, let's let's colonize Mars. That's going to take decades to even ha if it happens, it's going to take decades. In the meantime, what are we doing here? We just need to clean up our home. And uh, I hope that people will do that, which also I believe if we do that will help the existing species, including the keystone species. And, um, you know, so I'm 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 hopeful that that message uh, will start to be heard by folks uh, uh, that uh, you don't need science to tell you to clean up your home. Your parents tell you all the time as your kid growing up, clean your room, clean your room, clean your room, you know, uh, and uh, the parents, they clean the rest of the house or they get the kids. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, six kids, we got chores. And someone would get the living room and someone would get the dining room and someone would get the kitchen. And my brother and I usually got the front in the backyard to clean it up, mow it and so forth. Once my dad taught us how. So, you know, that's that's what we did. And and there was no science involved. <laughs> that was parenting. <laughs> and it was fine. And I learned a lot from that. Uh, David Mark Quigley is my guest. David Mark Quigley dot com. We'll also give you that other website uh, as well in the description uh, on the uh, uh, podcast and video cast. And uh David, I want to thank you so much for uh, sharing with us again. Uh, I know that there's there are a lot of different areas too. You being the, uh, as we've already stated, a Renaissance man. You are you've got your, you get your finger in a lot of pies. Let's put it that way. You, you know you really uh, uh, extended yourself, and obviously that helps to keep you busy, uh, as you've described earlier. That you know you really, aside from your meditation time, eh, you don't really like quiet time. You don't like to just uh, you know be sitting there doing nothing. And I'm kind of with you there. I really am. 
Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just so glad that I'm able to do the things that I'm doing and share these stories uh, uh, of people such as yourself who are making a difference in their lives and the lives of the people around them. Uh, and uh, we thank you again for uh, for joining us here on Tell Me Your Story. Well, thank you very much for having me, Richard. It's uh, been a great pleasure. And, um, you know, you, you brought up earlier about um, uh, people knowing more about something than, than you do. That's a philosophy that I've always, always had, that I somebody knows more about something than I do. So that's why they deserve my respect. Mm -hmm. in certain regards and so you know i've learned a lot this morning by just by by being a a guest of yours and listening to to what you have imparted and uh hopefully um you and some of your listeners have have done the same with some of the things that i've said so thank you very much it's been a great honor and um yeah i very much enjoyed it well, we will look forward to having you back again in the in the coming months to uh, obviously continue this conversation because I do enjoy uh, talking with you. And uh, uh, before we uh, let you go, I'm going to ask you those three questions uh, that I've asked uh, my guests uh, over the years, uh, which we are coming up to uh, 17 years of doing this program. And uh, it's actually kind of neat. Uh, I like the mile. I like milestones, folks. I really do. Uh, I I was excited, for example, when my father turned 70. And I posed um, a question to him. I said, so, Dad, uh, uh, what's it like uh, being 70? And he had two responses. One was, um, he says, uh, well, <clears throat> um, uh, the first uh, response to, uh, to the question uh, was, uh, well, uh, I didn't expect to live this long. And he lived another 20 years. Uh, and the second, uh, I believe, if I'm remembering collect correctly, was uh, uh, that I'm glad to be here. You know, and uh, he lived to be 90, almost 92. His birthday will be August 13th. And I'm going to find a way to uh, recognize and celebrate that after uh, his being gone for over a year. But uh, he isn't really gone. And uh, the folks that uh, the folks that we have uh, uh, seen pass uh, to the other side are not really gone. They're with us. Um, and uh, the longer that we talk about them and uh, make reference to them and communicate with them, uh, the more they stick around. I, I honestly do believe that. And I'm glad that you folks have stuck around for this program. Tell me your story, New Paradigms for a New World, where we're giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. And we are here on Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m., Wednesdays at 9 a.m., and Monday through Friday from 8 to 9 a.m. following the news, streaming live at those times at richarddugan.com. We have podcasts on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and many other locations. We're on YouTube where you can watch these conversations. We hope you'll subscribe and then click notification so that when I post a new conversation, you will be able to tune in. We're talking about nine conversations, nine guests, nine topics. Um, I, I, it's just, a, uh, it's amazing, uh, how, how we are expanding this program in this regard. And I'm very grateful, uh, for that opportunity. We also ask that if you can, uh, uh, support the work that we are doing here on tell me your story, we would be so gratefully appreciative. We do have a PayPal account. It is there for your security as well as ours. And, uh, all you have to do uh, when asked, who are you, uh, sending this contribution to? Put in my email address. It's richard at richarddugan.com. That's richard at richarddugan.com. And then spend some time going within and listening to that still small voice uh, as we encourage you to do during this, the decade of perfect vision. And with all of that being said, we uh, turn to our uh, very special guest and ask uh, of him those three final questions as we wrap up this edition of Tell Me Your Story. Who is David Mark Quigley? Well, David Mark Quigley is a writer, he is a eating practitioner, and he is a microbial warrior. What gets you up in the morning? Um, what gets me up in the morning is I want to make this world and uh, my world in particular a better place. And what was your best day? Uh, my best day is probably... Probably today, Richard, especially <laughs> after speaking with you. Well, I thank you so much for doing that, speaking with me here on the program. And 
Again, I thank you folks for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. We are giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. And until our next broadcast, podcast, videocast, love to lol. Jeanette, I am still listening. Dad, continue to be happy because I am. Smokey, I will see you on the other side. And to my dear friend Zorro, aho, aho. <laughs>